Everybody, welcome to the Podcast Academy's Masterclass on Protecting Your IP. I'm Amanda. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Education Director here. Really grateful to welcome Alexia from Claris Law. Um, Alexia, how you doing? Hi, Amanda. Great. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. We're uh, thank you so much. I'm Alexi. I'm going to blow up your spot a little bit here. Alexi is an entertainment and media lawyer at Claris Law, helping content creators, which includes everybody in this room, from podcast and audio book production companies to documentary filmmakers and studios. Um, definitely on their uh, developing their IP responsibly, keeping in mind the implications of constantly evolving technologies and emerging distribution models. So, Alexia, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to to you. Thank you again for being here. So excited to hear your talk. Thanks for the kind introduction. So hi, everybody. Um, Alexia, it's great to be here. It's uh, great to chat with you all about IP, which is such an important and wonderful part of uh, all the wonderful content that you create. Like all lawyers who start these um, presentations, I have to start with the, oh, for some reason, I can't move forward. Here we go with the usual disclaimer, which is that this is for educational purposes, it's not legal advice. And honestly, even though I have to do it ethically, for your own good, really, I, I would take it as, consider this as guidelines, especially in the context of IP and fair use and copyright, which unfortunately is not as clear cut as it ought to be. And so it, it can be a very subjective determination of whether something is a fair use or not, or what you should do, or is someone unlawfully using your content. So the goal for this is to really provide a, a framework of how to think about some of this. Some of these things you may have heard before, some will be newer, but hopefully um, there will be things that you can think about going forward that will be useful here, and that this is at least a, a roadmap to start. So why, you know, Amanda and I chatted about interesting topics and why IP and why protecting it and why is it so important? So there's just here a couple of headlines that you see that we've all seen them, right? That podcasts are Hollywood gold, um, that they're a treasure trove, treasure trove of intellectual property, that Hollywood, and I use Hollywood to mean really the, the film and TV industry generally, is looking to podcasts as starting IP. And so the, the IP and podcasting is really important. And there's sometimes a little bit of a tendency maybe to think, you know, oh, I recorded this, I put it out there. Did I really create IP? And, you know, the answer is absolutely. And you've created not only one type of IP, but really multiple layers of IP. And this can be one of the shortcomings often in a podcast contract is that it'll just say who owns the podcast. Well, what does that really mean, right? Because the podcast, as you can see here with this hyper-technical graphic, um, the podcast is just one word, but it encompasses so many things, right? So if you start at the top, you can have pre-existing content in there. So if you're the host or you're working with the host or you're a producer working with the host, there's probably content that, you know, maybe you're leveraging pre-existing materials that have been done in the past that you're bringing into the podcast, um, pre-existing writings, so there's that. Then if you move down, there's the actual podcast script that's being recorded and read. There's the sound recordings themselves. There's the RSS feed and the title. And you could probably add more to these, but this is just, you know, sort of visually to illustrate that if you just say, I own the podcast or you own the podcast or we co-own the podcast, what does that mean? And so it's really important to I think both be aware of all the wonderful IP you've created, but also that you can think of it, whatever image you want to use, a pie or how to slice it, there are different components and they don't all have to be dealt with the same way. Now, just taking a step back a little bit, what is protectable IP and what isn't? So, you know, you can protect your IP in different ways, copyright, trademarks, patents. I've left patents off the slide here because you know, in most cases, it's not going to really apply in the day to day, but copyright and trademark are the ones that really will come up most frequently. So, you know, if you look on the left of the right of the screen, there's the things that you can't protect. And so there's really this distinction in copyright. And this is, you know, bear with me, we'll, we'll get more into the weeds. This is just the level settings, um, uh, the level setting slide. But things that you can't protect are ideas, concepts, all of those things are 
are not what we talk about when we say protectable IP. What we're talking about is really the expression of those ideas. So the scripts, your show notes, exactly how you have put those ideas into what copyright calls a fixed medium, tangible medium of expression. So the scripts, the recordings, all of those things are things that are protectable by copyright. Um, and then there are other things that are protectable as trademarks. So the title of a series, that can be protected as a trademark. Um, you know, a catchphrase, that can be protected as a trademark, not really as a copyright, because typically short phrases are not protected by copyright. Logo, right? The little square that's next to your podcast that, you know, is kind of like a music album cover. That's also something that could be registered a design along with the name. And then I've put the RSS feed a little bit as a question mark because what is exactly an RSS feed? Is it really protectable by copyright or not? But what's for sure is that it's definitely an asset that you can think of in terms of your intellectual property. And that even if it doesn't say that you are the copyright owner of it, at the very least, you want to call out in your contracts or your agreements who controls it and you know who owns that asset. So it's definitely should be uh, top of mind because I don't have to tell the people in, in this virtual room how important it is, but that's definitely something where I get questions all the time. I, in fact, I got a question right before getting on this webinar of, hey, who owns the feed here? Can we drop another show into the pre-existing feed or not? So this really comes up all the time. So how to protect your IP? I thought about this and the truth is there are tons of resources for how to go about protecting your IP. And so I don't want to spend too much time here. What I've done is I've put some links and in terms of how, right? So for your podcasts, if you're talking about the sound recording and the scripts, there are great resources on the US Copyright Office. There are videos, there are step-by-step -step guides. You know, lawyers probably don't want us saying this, but you don't really necessarily need a lawyer to help you register your copyright. There are great guides to help you do that. So if you look on those links, you can find them. And keep in mind that if you own both the sound recording and the script, um, you can do that in, in one registration. But if the ownership is separate, one party owns the sound recording, another party owns the script, you would have to deal with those separately. And, you know, I think the more interesting question is when, right? Because to, to register copyright, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the most expensive thing. For example, registering trademarks costs more. We're talking, you know, hundreds of dollars in the application versus, you know, I think it's 35 or 55 for the episode, but it can still be cost prohibitive. And so there's more of a question of when to register copyrights. You know, do you register all the episodes? Do you register the episodes that you think are going to be the biggest drivers for an audience? Do you register the episodes maybe that you think have the most potential to either be infringed or the most potential to be adapted into a derivative. So if you have to be selective about what to register, that's sort of how I would think about going about your registration strategy. And you can talk to you know people within your business and bounce ideas off, but you don't have to register every single episode. What you should just think about is if you want to, if someday, one day, someday, one day, someone breaches your copyright or infringes or copies it and you want to sue them in order to bring a lawsuit, you have to have registered the copyright. So you could see the infringement, register it, and then bring the lawsuit, but then that'll impact what kind of damages you can ask for. So keep that in mind, right? If, if this is really a property that I want to have zero roadblocks enforcing, if somebody one day infringes on it, that's a property you should um, register. And then again, how, there's a lot of resources online how to go about that. Same for registering trademarks. Um, you know, if you're starting and you have a title, it's a good idea. Look on Apple Podcasts, look on Spotify for the title you're thinking of using. See if there are other podcasts out there using it. You can also look up specifically for trademarks that have been registered. But again, you might have someone out there who's using a trademark that they have not registered, but they're still out there using it and they'll still have certain rights to that. So while searching the trademark office is important because you'll know what trademarks have been registered, you'll also just practically want to know what's in use out there. And so searching places where you can commonly find podcasts. You know, other things to think about in terms of how you protect are really your contracts. So when you're working with 
whoever contributes anything to your podcast, whether that's a writer, a host, a executive producer, producer, a sound engineer, a designer, the person who's designing the logo, you know, even if your friend who's a wonderful pianist that she put together the piece that she you know, said, hey, I wrote this, I think it'll be great as the theme song for your podcast, even having an agreement with her is very important because unless and until you have an agreement, she owns that piece of work. And if your relationship changes one day, she could say, actually, I don't want you using it anymore. So having an agreement that's either you're getting a license or that it's a work for hire for you, which means that from the moment it's created and you are treated as the owner, it's always really important to have agreements that relate to all of the pieces of content in and around your podcast. So that's a really good way of protecting your IP is starting off on the right foot. And then you also want to think and this might be something if there's interest of having a, a webinar on this and going more in depth of you know how to draft contracts where you have joint ownership of IP because you might have the podcast recordings are owned by one entity, whereas the underlying scripts are owned by another. That's you know typically you know often if you have your a podcast production company who's funding a podcast, the person funding the podcast will often own the sound recordings, but not necessarily the underlying scripts. And where the ownership is separate, it's very important to specify who has rights to what. So if you co-own the scripts or you co-own the podcast by law, that means that you all have each the rights to do all of the things that a copyright holder can do. So you can each authorize a film TV derivative to be made based off your podcast. You can each authorize a t-shirt to be made with the art work of your show. You can each hold an event and charge entry, provided that you account to each other those revenues. That's by virtue of law if you're joint owners. But if that's not what you want, because maybe one of you is really good at making merch and one of you is really good at pitching it as a film TV adaptation, if you want only one of you to have the rights to do that, that's something you would have to contract. So that would be the last bullet point is where you have split ownership is to be very clear about who controls those rights and how you split the beneficial interest, how you, you know, basically split the revenue for that. In this uh, presentation, we were going to talk about, you know, when can I use someone else's IP and what to do if I see somebody else using mine. And so I deliberately thought we would start with when can, can you use third party IP because realizing how much wiggle room there is and all the things you can do to use other people's IP, I think is helpful in terms of thinking practically what to do when you see other people having used yours. So we'll start with that, which is when can you use other people's IP? And there's really three main ways. You either license it, which is the, you know, if you have the budget for it and you want to, and you want to be sure that you're not going to have any issues, that's the the most foolproof way, as long as you're you know, abiding by the terms of the license, or you find material that's in the public domain and that's free to use, or you fair use it, which is uh, the copyright exception, which allows you, recognizes that there are certain uses of copyrighted works that we should be able to make without having to get permission and pay the copyright holder because it's fair, right? That's where the First Amendment meets Copyright Act. So running through each of these quickly, if you are licensing content, I've put on this slide a few things to think about in terms of all of the, the things that should be in a license or that you should look out for, right? So if you're licensing content, what's the term? Are you getting rights to it forever or is it limited? And super important if it's limited, sometimes your budgets are simply not gonna allow to license content in perpetuity, right? It's gonna be two years, a year, five years, 10 years, that's okay, provided one, you have a way to track your use. So you have a calendar reminder, you have a rights management system, you have someone who's really organized, something that's gonna remind you after two years or the end of your term that you have to take the content down. But ideally what you have is you have pre-negotiated a renewal in the license so that in two years, when your two-year term runs, you have an automatic right to renew for the same fee because you don't want in two years suddenly to have to pay five times more. The licensor has decided to you know, jack up the fees. So it's always a good idea if you have to agree to limited terms to have a renewal. 
then what are the grant of rights? You know, are you getting rights to use it just in the podcast? Is it single use? Is it, do you have the right to use it in promo? Does it say that you don't have the right to use it in promo? Can you use it in derivatives? Derivatives are a pretty important word in the podcast space because like we saw in the first slide, if you then wanna turn the podcast into an audiobook or you wanna turn the podcast into a TV show, do you have to relicense the work or did you get that right from the get-go? Are there any restrictions on your use? You know, this happens often if you're licensing music, it'll often say you can't use the title of the song as the title of the podcast. Um, so any kind of restrictions on your use, that's something to keep an eye for. Crediting obligations. If you've agreed to credit, then you need to be able to do so. So it's often helpful to say, you know, you add language to the extent archival credits are provided, then sure, I'll credit you or wherever cre archival credits are provided. So you have a qualified obligation so that if you haven't credited anyone, that's okay. You want the ability to assign, especially if you're then going to you know, release your podcast with a distributor or network that your licenses have to be assignable to a third party. And reps and warranties, this is one that I always keep an eye out for. And I thought would be helpful here is if you're licensing an interview and there's people, obviously the people's voices in the interview, you want to make sure that you're not contractually agreeing to getting appearance releases from the voices in the interview, because probably as a matter of law, you don't need to. And so if it says you'll obtain all rights and permissions with nothing else, then you're contractually agreeing to do so. So you always want to throw in that word, all necessary rights, which means that if as a matter of law, you don't need to, then that's okay. And no injunctive relief. Uh, to the extent possible, whenever you're licensing content, you want to make sure that the license or the, if you've breached the license, their remedy is they can sue you for damages or something, but they can't force you to take the content down. You can't always get that, but it's good to try. Public domain. So content in the public domain, this changes every year. Um, so on the first, right now it's works published before in 1926 are in the public domain works created by the US government are in the public domain, works that are made available to the public for free use. So for example, Creative Commons licenses. One thing to note with Creative Commons licenses is there are many, I think there are five or six different types of Creative Commons licenses and they each have different terms. So whenever something's made available on the basis of a Creative Commons license, check which license it is and read the terms of the specific license because sometimes you can use it just in the podcast, but not in derivatives. Sometimes you can use it, but you have to credit. Sometimes you can use it, but then you have to also make it freely available. So make sure that the license terms are clear to you. And two notes that just I've noticed come up often with clients and sort of maybe misconceptions in the space, just because something's been posted publicly, whether it's on social media or YouTube, does not automatically make it in the public domain. So that's important to note. I have this point on the fair use slide, but I'll raise it here. Works that have been introduced as evidence and hearings are not in the public domain by default. So this is really important. It comes up a lot with clients who are doing true crime podcasts where it's part of the show notes or on the website. They want to put a lot of images that were in the court case that's relevant to the podcast up on the website and they go and they find them in the court records. And so they assume that they're in the public domain. Introducing something as evidence makes it a matter of the public record in the case, but doesn't automatically transform it into public domain. So, you know, is, is the person maybe less likely to sue the holder because it's been used so often? Maybe, but that's an important distinction to remember. And probably the most important one, which comes up a lot for podcasters, is exactly which version of the work is in the public domain. So Winnie the Pooh is a good example, right? The Winnie the Pooh, the original story, or the, the one specific version of it has fallen into, I think as of this year, the public domain. So that if you wanna do a, a rewrite or a retelling of that Winnie the Pooh story, you can um, of that specific version. But the Disney yellow bear that's there on the bottom of the screen, that specific version of Winnie the Pooh, that bear has not fallen into the public domain. So it's always very important to make sure you know exactly which work you're referring to and making sure that that specific version you want to use is what's in the public domain. And the third one, right, if you go back and we said the three ways we had license, public domain, fair use, the third one is fair use. And fair use is, you know, here's, this is where 
I apologize on behalf of the legal community because it's a it's a tool that is meant to serve creators and it's unfortunately very murky and unclear what is a fair use. And so these slides will hopefully in this conversation help a little bit think about what is a fair use and what's not, but there's no bright line rule. So I'll start with that. If you look what I put at the bottom, fair use myths, you hear them all the time that if you use less than 30 seconds, it's a fair use. If you use two lines of a song, it's a fair use or only one line of a poem, or if it's for educational purposes, none of those are true. They're really myths. Um, so if anyone ever tells you or you see guidance online about that, ignore it. Now, fair use, what it always comes down to is it's, a, it's in the statute in the Copyright Act that says in order to decide if something's a fair use, we look at these four characters. And they're the ones that are listed on the screen. And really the, the most important ones to think about, and they're sort of the gut reaction ones, are the, the ones I highlighted in bold. So one and, and three, really, which is, you know, how are you using it? Are you doing what the courts call? Is it a transformative use? And are you using it for no more than necessary to achieve that? So a transformative use is where you you know, ask yourself that question that's there on the screen, which is, am I using the work for the same purpose as the original creator, or am I giving it a new meaning or a new purpose? So if I am making, you know, my podcast is about different ways of, um, different ways that the media, different media outlets cover a specific news event. And I'm showing different clips. I'm showing a clip from CNN. I'm showing a clip from ABC. I'm showing a clip from Fox. And I play those clips and I'm commenting on it and speaking about the different way that the specific event was covered, that's a very good example of fair use because the original purpose of the new, of the content was to give the news, whereas your purpose is to discuss how news outlets, different outlets relay the news. So you're adding new meaning, you're giving the work a new purpose. And then, you know, the, the third question is, are you using no more than necessary to make your point? The amount that you're using has to just serve your purpose. And unfortunately, where it starts to veer from, I need this to make my point to, but I'm gonna keep using a bit more because it sounds really good. That's the point at which you have to stop um, because where it becomes aesthetic is where it stops to become a fair use. And then the other is, you know, think of the, the actual work you're using. So if you're using something that's news, uh, highly factual, there there's somewhat less copyright protection than if you're using a song, a poem, something that's a creative work. So that also plays into the analysis. So you can probably have a bit, feel a bit more leeway of, you know, quoting a little bit more liberally from a news report or an interview than you would from a song um, because of where it falls on that sort of creative spectrum. And then the last one is the effect on the use. You know, are you basically stepping into the opportunity for the copyright holder to do what you're doing, right? And most of the time you're not, because if you're transforming it and you're adding new meaning, then the original person who wrote the work doesn't have a monopoly on licensing for all commentary on their work. And a couple of other things, which I, I just spoke about here, but things to think about when you're fair using and to really have a good, strong argument to use other people's content, you know, use only as much as necessary don't use fair use content as sound beds or B-roll, right? So if you have your host is speaking, it stops, it cuts to the archival. The archival is like a pretty clean cut if you need a second or two, you know, just to transition so it's not abrupt. But you don't want the fair use material to keep running for a long time under the host speaking because at that point, the fair use argument is really difficult to make. Um, you know, ask yourself, can you replace the clip with anything else? If you can, then it's difficult to have a good fair use argument because you don't specifically need that clip. You're kind of using it more as B-roll. Um, and a few of the other ones I already touched here. One important one is also, because it happens all the time as a, in podcasts, if you've reached out to a source and they've provided the material to you and you've somehow agreed in the emails or at any point that you would license it, you can't then fair use that specific content. You could decide the license fee you quoted um, you know, in the end is cost prohibitive and I'm, I'm not going to move forward with this license. If you haven't agreed to license it in the first place, it's okay, but just be very careful that you haven't somehow implicitly agreed to license it. 
Um, so, and it's also a good idea if you've reached out to license something and they quote you a fee that's too high, you know, kind of close the loop and say, thank you, but I won't be pursuing this. And then maybe you went and you found it somewhere else. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing that as long as you haven't agreed to license it in the first place. Now, with all that said, which hopefully provides some context of there's a lot of leeway to use other people's IP, what happens when you see that someone has used your IP? And I think the knee-jerk reaction can be a little bit, well, I'm going to send them a cease and desist letter. I'm going to tell them to take it down. Maybe, but what's your goal, right? Because maybe you're not so annoyed that someone has, else has used your content, but you want to be credited. So it'll, you know, if that's your goal, then how do you achieve that goal? Sending an angry cease and desist letter probably isn't going to do it. But if you send an email saying, you know, I just heard your podcast, it's great. You clipped uh, a section of mine. Um, I'm okay with that, but I would like, well, don't say I'm okay with that. I take that back, but say, you know, I, I'm, I would like to be credited. Um, please, you know, here's, please add this to the show notes. So think about what your goal is rather than just immediately saying cease and desist. Now, if it's an egregious use, then a cease and desist letter probably is appropriate. This happens a lot, unfortunately, in true crime where, you know, maybe you're a journalist who spent a very long time reporting on a story and then you tune into a podcast and your entire few years of work have been essentially replicated in the podcast and there's no attribution to you. All your research is used. You know, that's where maybe you're going to want to speak to a lawyer. So it really depends what you want to do. If it's been posted on a platform, that's the second bullet point on the slide. They probably have notice and takedown provisions because to, without getting too into the weeds under the Copyright Act, if you're a platform and you don't want to be liable for copyright infringement, you have to provide this kind of notice and takedown. So check the terms of use. There's probably contact information there and steps for exactly what to do if you see that your IP has been infringed. And one thing to think about also is, and that's you know one of the great things about the podcast community is how vocal it is and supportive and how people talk about things and everybody holds themselves accountable, but just be careful about what you say, because if you go out and write in a forum, so-and-so plagiarized my work and they didn't, that's potentially a defamatory statement. So by no means am I saying you should be inactive and let other people use your IP if you think they don't have a defense for it. Just be careful in the public statements you make because you could involuntarily end up entangling yourself in some defamation lawsuit or issue that you didn't want to be involved in in the first place. So it really depends, really. What's your goal when you see your IP has been used? You know, how, how have they used it? Is it, when you look at it, the kind of use that you say, oh, you know, that's what I do. That You know, I think that's a fair use. If you're not sure, get a second opinion. If you're sure that it's clearly a copy of yours or if your podcast is being played somewhere, you know, other than an RSS feed without your permission, or somebody's put out a summary of your podcast or saying they, you know, don't necessarily have the right to do. Those are definitely things you could take action for, whether it's writing a letter yourself, whether it's writing an email, whether it's hiring a lawyer. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, there's just not a one-stop shop because it'll depend on what your goal is and what you want to achieve. Now, with that, I think we can move to Q. And A, let me move over to the next slide. So let me see, I'll just pull it up. Without contracts and agreements in place with guests, can they come back and claim the IP? So guests are, that's a great question, Megan. And I'll, one thing to say first with guest releases. It's, you know how there's fair use myths? The guest release myth is a little bit one too, that every single person who appears on your podcast has to sign a guest release. That's not actually legally true, right? If somebody, unless you have a hidden camera and somebody doesn't know that they're being interviewed for a podcast, but if somebody's sitting down with you and knows, or you've invited them or send them an email and they've consented to being on the podcast, they don't, as a matter of law, need to sign a guest release. The reason why a lot of people do get guest releases is for a number of things. One, it makes it very clear what you can do. So without a guest release, they can appear on your podcast, you can play the podcast, but what kind of promotion can you do, right? Can you promote just the podcast? Can you use one of their clips to promote your network more generally or your production company or your other shows? 
Probably not. So there are limits to that implied license if you don't have a guest release. So that's why it's often helpful. And you'll often have a release of claims in a guest release. And it'll often say in a guest release that they don't have any ownership to the IP and the actual recording itself. And it's a little bit of a murky area of law of the ownership of interviews. Does the interviewee own the interview or does the interviewer own the interview? There's honestly not a single cohesive answer to that. Different circuits across the states have come out differently on that. But if somebody has, I think you can you can take the position that if somebody has voluntarily consented to participate in your podcast and you record them, if they later come back and saying you didn't have the right to do that, unless they can show that you misled them, that they didn't know they were being interviewed, then they can't come back and, and claim it. It's just what they might say is that you've exceeded the terms of the implied license that I agreed to by, you know, you've done all these other things other than using it in the podcast. Um, so that's that's one thing to to consider to consider there. Uh, are audiobooks and podcasts legally distinct when it comes to IP rights? They are not legally distinct in terms of the eyes of copyright law, right? They're both sound recordings. Um, they both have underlying literary works. So in, in that way, they're not, but there are, might be different distinctions in terms of your agreements, right? The RSS feed ownership is going to be important in a podcast agreement. If you're distributing your audio book behind a paywall, then that might not be as important a feature in your agreement. Although, should you ever decide to distribute it through an RSS feed, it's also helpful to say who would own that. So they're not legally distinct in the eyes of the law, but you might have different business models in terms of how you monetize them. Um, and you may have different, you know, production schedules that you set out. You may have different, if you're hiring a writer on an audiobook, you may want them to, as part of what you're agreeing to pay them, think about asking the fee includes, you know, a draft, a rough draft, certain sets of revisions. So the writing might be a little bit more involved in terms of that and what the services are, but in just in terms of the IP and copyright law, no, they're the same. Can you please clarify the use of songs? Can you state the lyrics of a song as a reference without playing the music? Is it illegal for podcasts to have the same titles as song titles? Great questions, anonymous attendee. Um, can you state the lyrics of the song as a reference without playing the music? So yes, if you're talking about, um, What's the first song that's going to come to mind? A Beatles song. Uh, and you're talking about the lyrics and that when uh, you can Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and what is the song about and where were they when they were writing the song and that there are hints in the song. And when you listen to this lyric and then you quote the lyric and then you comment on it, you can fair use lyrics of a song in the same way you fair use any other content. So it's not because it says lyric that it's treated differently. So the fair use analysis to the lyrics would be the same as the fair use analysis if you were reading a passage from a book. So those two things would be the same and you don't have to play the music to fair use it. I mean, in fact, if it's a really litigious um, estate or copyright holder, it might actually, in terms of a risk assessment, you may prefer not to play the song um, unless you think you have a good fair use claim to it. So you can definitely fair use lyrics, especially if you're commenting on it in the same way you would another work. And then is it illegal for podcasts to have the same titles as the song titles? That will really depend on the, you know, if a song, if whoever wrote a song has trademarked the title of the song, perhaps in a certain class that conflicts with, maybe you might not be able to register it, but it, it seems unlikely that the title of the song has uh, done so. And even if they have, there's a First Amendment exception to that, which is if you are writing a podcast where there's a rational relationship between the title and the content, you could still um, you could still call it the same. So if you have a podcast that's called Beat It, and it's all about, um, I don't know, the most infamous firings over the past 20 years and all the times people have been told to beat it, and that's sort of your, your tagline, and there's a rational relationship between the title and the song, 
then yes. I mean, the one thing you just said, be careful if you're using a known song title is in your promotion. You don't want to, you don't want anyone to be misled and thinking that the musicians of the song title are behind it. You don't want to do anything that's going to lead to consumer confusion because then even if there's no trademark claim necessarily, the owners or the writers may come after you for that. So, and then the third thing, which I mentioned before, is sometimes when you license music for a podcast, one of the conditions of the music license is that you can't use the title of the song as the title of the podcast. So if ever you're licensing a song and you have, just check the, the terms of the license for that. Let's see, how much do you recommend budgeting for legal review before releasing? That's a very good question. Um, that's really going to depend on the lawyer you hire. You know, there's different lawyers that will offer you flat rates for certain packages of contracts, others that are going to charge hourly. So it really depends. But what I would what I would think about is if you're if if you're talking about legal review for contracts, maybe think about the amount of contracts you have. And what you should be able to do is you should be able to go to a lawyer, ask them, hi, you know, what's your hourly rate? Here are the amount of contracts I need drafted. You know, I have forms or I don't have forms. I think these are going to be difficult negotiations. I think these are not. Can you give me an estimate of how long? And then based on what their hourly fee is and how many hours they think it's going to take, they will be able to give you an idea. Same for legal review of the episodes. If you're reviewing every episode um, and you give them the length of the episode, also you can maybe get an estimate. One thing to help of is, you know, the more you give the lawyer upfront information, the more you'll save your self in, in legal fees. So if you're delivering a script to a lawyer to review, if you annotate very clearly in the script what's third party material that's been licensed, put that in one color, what's third party material that's been unlicensed, put that in another color, put a note about where you've gotten the content originally. Um, also include, you know, if you fact check, if you've written anything that might be defamatory or that's a sensitive statement, put the sources for it because the lawyer who's reviewing it is going to ask you what's your source. So anything you can do to sort of limit the back and forth will help you keep your budget um, lower, hopefully. Uh, let's see, when do you play synthetic media in the mix, text to speech, speech to speech, text to video? I use human talent plus AI in my audio fiction. So uh, I guess the question is maybe what are the copyright implications of using artificial intelligence? And that's a really interesting one. As of now, at least, the US Copyright Office, interestingly, does not recognize artificially intelligent, artificial machine generated work as protected by copyright. So if you're asking if you can use AI generated work in your podcast, yes, there's no issue vis-a-vis -vis where it was generated because that material is not considered copyrightable, at least not as of today's date. Um, and then the question is whether you can protect that combination of the two. And this is a question that lawyers debate all the time, like how what's the protection for computer generated works? And there's no great answer to that yet, but if you have a mix, I would still, you know, have the full script, the transcript of it and the full sound recording. And at the very least, the whole will be able to be protected, even if there might be specific parts of it that aren't, the whole will be. So I would, uh, you know, at least think about it that way as a whole to start. Showing a film in a class or group setting in its entirety can be viewed as an infringement and specific licenses uh, are needed to do so legally. Can the same be said about podcasts? So the really great thing about podcasts is that, you know, at the very least, if podcasts are distributed through an RSS feed, anywhere that catches the feed, there's this license essentially to do so. And so that's part of the, the beauty of podcasting is if you catch the feed that the, if the company, the production company or the host or the creator, as long as they lawfully dropped it in the feed to start with, anywhere that can catch that feed can catch that feed without needing to get permission. That's sort of the, the whole beauty of wide, um, you know, freely distributed content, a widely distributed content, sorry. So if it's in that way, um, no, but if you're, 
one, you know, there's a little bit of a wrinkle there. If you're playing a music with a podcast that has a lot of music, then technically there may be some royalties that are due when the music's played, but that would probably be an issue at the level of the platform who's playing it, not you specifically using it. So you should be able to play a podcast in a, a classroom without really too many issues, as long as that podcast was made available by the copyright holder to, to begin with. And I think, let me see, I think that takes us to the end of the questions. I left my uh, my name, my email, I was checking to see if it was there. Yeah, my email, my LinkedIn, if you have any questions or you wanted to get in touch, anything you didn't feel free, uh, didn't feel comfortable asking here, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Oh, wow. This has been so informative, Alexia, as I expected it would be. Um, we do have time for one more question if anybody wants to sneak it in. I think that um, everybody probably has a million questions. Um, I will do a little vamping here just to, again, mention that this has been such an incredible talk, Alexa. Alexia, we just we need to hire you, all of us collectively. <laughs> So maybe you got a bunch of new clients in here. Um, so folks, again, if you've got a lot out of this talk, Alexia, big shout out to you. We're going to have Alexia back in December. Somebody had submitted earlier a question about international considerations, and that is such an on-point question that we had actually anticipated that, and we will have a whole panel dedicated to that. So if you want to attend that or others, definitely please um, do sign up to be a member of the Podcast Academy. We have also a member, I'm sorry, a, ma a masterclass panel coming up on September 1st. I saw we had some people who are doing scripted fiction, so it might be really interesting for you to come and listen to some Audible panelists talking about their their production best practices and the considerations and certainly they're going to be talking about ip and maybe how they do source that content because um definitely that those are very highly produced um podcasts so folks um don't be shy we do have a little bit of time for questions i did chat into the um little chat box a link for you to complete a survey as well. We definitely love to hear from y'all on how uh, we can better address your questions and stage other opportunities for great learning like this. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, TPA members, you will be able to access the on-demand review of this webinar as well as the deck through the member portal. And um, we certainly want to thank you all again for joining us. Um, I'm going to stop record. And thank everybody for being here again.